Now, in this Easter Sunday, the theme of our message is just simply entitled Resurrection. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 37. Beginning in verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth amongst them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Right here, we find that Ezekiel the prophet gets a vision of what we're told later on in verse 11 is the whole house of Israel. He's brought to a valley, a desert valley, a huge desert valley that's filled with skeletons. And the Bible says right here that the Spirit led him back and forth through the entire valley. And God asked him, Son of man, can these bones live? And he says, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. And we read on. Then God said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I'll put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound. And the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them, and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army, and the church said, Amen. What an incredible passage. Right here he gets this vision of the entire house of Israel as being dead. Very dead. All the skeletons scattered on the desert floor. And he asked Ezekiel, is there any hope for Israel? And he says, Sovereign Lord, you would all know. He says, preach, prophesy to these bones, Ezekiel. And so he began to preach the word of God. Amen? Amen. And the Bible says that the bones started to come together. And there was a rattling sound. You know, we, we know how it is. When we preach, amen? You know, it's kind of interesting. It is great to have the Bordieres with us, amen? And they traveled a long time to uh, come and be with us. So I was able to ask Denise a little question this morning. I said, hey, sis, did you wake up grumpy this morning? And she says, no, I let them sleep. You know, when you wake people up, they're a little bit grumpy. Are you with me right here? And we know... A preacher preaches to a dead Israel. There's a little grumpiness that goes on. There's a little rattling of the bones. Are you with me here, church? And the Bible says, well, Ezekiel, is there life now in these bones? He says, no. There's no spirit. There are bodies, but there's no spirit. He says, then preach again. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit entered these people. And they stood up. A vast army. Verse 11. Then God said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dry up and our hope is gone. We're cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Oh, my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. Is that exciting right here? I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you 
up from them. You know, we understand that the Old Testament is the physical foreshadowing of the spiritual truths of the New Testament. Here we find that God is saying that all of spiritual Israel, which was a nation at that time, which was a group of people, the Hebrews, was dead. How parallel is it to our times? When we look around Southern California at all the churches, there's so many people that don't even go. They're just bones scattered on the desert floor. There are other people that go, but there's no life in them. Are you with me right here? How can there be resurrection for spiritual Israel, the church? Well, we find it right here. You simply have to preach the word. Now, when you preach the word, there's going to be some rattling. When you wake people up, there's going to be some grumpiness. But it's the only way back to life. And life comes not just when the word is preached, but the people accept it as the very words of God and obey it with all of their heart because they love the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Are you with me right here? You know, earlier this week, one of our leaders was asked the question, why start a new church? Why are you here? I mean... Good gravy. You go down to Sal's house down there in Hawthorne, and you've got three churches, church buildings, I should say, in a span of less than a block. I mean, Southern California is littered with churches. Why start a new church? Why the City of Angels International Christian Church? There's got to be a uniqueness. Number one, we believe in the resurrected Jesus. Number two, we believe that the word of God is inspired and infallible. Number three, we believe in the vision that Jesus gave the early church to evangelize the world in a generation. Number four, we believe that the church should be composed of only sold out disciples of Jesus Christ. And number five, we have come to bring water and revitalization to those that thirst in the desert of what's called denominationalism. That is unique. That is unique. You know, it's kind of interesting having the Bordieres here. Uh, Elaine and I, in some ways, haven't known them a long time. We first got to know them when we first arrived in Portland. And the church there was hurting. You talk about a desert, a spiritual desert. You talk about skeletons laying on the floor. That's how it was. But Nick and Denise, they took a stand. And when we began preaching the word, there was life that came into them. And it was awesome. And it's been so fantastic to be able to see the Lord work in such a powerful way in Portland. I mean, in three years' time, we've gone from 25 people to over 500 people. God has blessed us. But what's really exciting is to see the kind of sold-out hearts that I believe the Bordieres represent as well as the entire Portland Mission team. Uh, Nick worked for 16 years for Nike. Now, Portland is the world headquarters for Nike. Amen, guys? 16 years. 20, excuse me. Time flies when you're having fun, I guess, you know. Making a six-figure salary. Stock options, really nice house, and he owned a second house. And then we said, hey, Nick and Denise, we'd love for you to be our partners in the gospel and come down to Los Angeles and join us in evangelizing that great city to be a beacon of light for the whole world. You know something? In just a few days of prayer, they said, absolutely we will leave everything in order to preach Jesus Christ. You know, I was talking to Kyle Bartholomew just uh, last night. He's the brother in the church there in Hilo. And it really demonstrates, I think, the kind of spirit and heart when every single person in the church is a sold-out disciple. 
You know, churches don't grow unless they're filled with sold out disciples. Are you with me right here? Churches don't baptize. There's no mission because lukewarmness stops the forceful advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, just a few years ago, the Hilo Church was thriving, had about 100 on Sunday mornings. There's 60 disciples there going. And then in our former fellowship, sweeping changes were made. In just a few short months, the church had dwindled to 35 on Sunday mornings. That includes the kids and only 10 to 15 on, Sunday, on Wednesday nights. Uh, they got a new minister, Kyle Bartholomew. And Kyle said, listen, I don't see anything really happening. We, I'm going to go visit Portland. When he went to Portland, he says, man, I see it. That's the church I was baptized in. And so he went back to his leadership. He says, hey, we got to get Kip and Elena. We need the influence of the Portland church, and we want to build a base of sold-out disciples. So they invite us back at the end of September. Elena and I went back, and we preached the word on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And by Sunday morning, we had just 12 sold-out disciples left. One person said, boy, it's a good thing you didn't stay an extra day, Kip. They'd had nobody right there. <laughs> Six months later, now this is after a year of having no baptisms, they've seen 13 people baptized in the Jesus Christ. That's the multiplication of disciples. Are you with me here, church? You see, any church can be resurrected, but it takes the preaching of the word of God and the response of the people to wholeheartedly Obey it. Amen? Well, what's it going to take for us to evangelize the world in a generation? What's it going to take for us to resurrect the dead in the city of angels? I believe there are three things. Number one, we need to preach the resurrection of Jesus. Number two, we need to preach the resurrection of a new life. And number three, we need to preach the resurrection on the final day. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Right here, Paul writes to the church of Corinth. And he says in verse 1, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you've taken your stand. You know, sometimes we need to be reminded of the good news. Amen, church? By this gospel you were saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. But what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures, that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to scriptures, and he appeared to Peter and then the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep, some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as the one abnormally born. Remember, Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. For I am the least of the apostles, do not deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecute the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Right here, Paul outlines to the Christians, what is the gospel? It's simply the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for a lot of people today, religions have become blurred. They look at Christianity as simply another religion. And yet Paul right here is trying to remind the disciples, no, this is not just a religion. This is what life is all about. He says, Jesus resurrected from the dead. That's the good news. You know, when you look in the tomb of Confucius, you'll find his bones. When you look in the tomb of Buddha, you'll find his bones. When you look in the tomb of Muhammad, you'll find his bones. When you look in the tomb even of our father of faith, Abraham, you'll find his bones. When you look in the tomb of Lenin, you'll find his bones. But you look in the tomb of Jesus, and it's empty. Amen, church? But you know, as glorious as the resurrection is, the real power of the gospel centers in on Jesus' death. Turn me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, the communion. And we're going to be partaking of the communion right after the message. Look at what he says right here in verse 26 of chapter 11. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Wow. He's not talking about physically weak. He's not talking about physically sick or physically falling asleep. He's talking about spiritually that way. He says you've you spiritually gotten weak. You've spiritually gotten sick. You've spiritually fallen asleep. You're dead because you've forgotten that Jesus died for you. You know, there's a story that came to my mind last night, given that I have my son Sean visiting. And Elaine and I are very blessed. We, we have two boys and one awesome daughter. And we have two awesome boys, of course. And this is a true story that took place many years ago in El Paso, Texas. And it, it's about two brothers. One of the brothers was five years old and the other was two years old. And the father used to love to watch his boys play in the old tree in the backyard. And so he'd usually sit in the porch and watch the two boys and one day, it was a very gusty day there in Texas. And evidently, the older boy was climbing on one of the branches below that was a dead branch. And all of a sudden, with the strong gust of wind, the branch cracked. He looked down, and he saw his little brother standing right under this branch. He dropped down, pushed his little brother totally out of the way, and the branch came crashing down on the five-year-old. The father rushes on out. And the five-year-old just had two things to say before he died. He says, Father, is my brother safe? And the dad said, yes. And then he says, Daddy, it hurts so bad. Well, it was such a high-impact situation that the father never talked to the younger boy about the incident for years. And the boy evidently had blocked it out. And then one day, the younger son stumbled on a photograph. He would put all the photographs away. And he saw the two boys. And he brought it to his dad. And he says, Dad, who is this? And his father just broke down crying. He says, it's your older brother. He saved you. And he told him the story. And, and the younger brother just broke down crying. And just out of, out of thankfulness to the person that he really had known nothing about. And you know, in a very real way, we need to understand that God is our father. And that Jesus is our older brother. Amen, church? And Jesus died on the cross, he pushed us out of the way of what we should have died for, our sins. And he died in our place. And on the cross, for the first time being separated from his father by sin, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Daddy, why does it hurt so bad? You know, when you really grab on that Jesus died for you personally, it's going to motivate you. See, that's why as disciples we need to be reminded of the death, burial, and resurrection. But right here at communion, the reason that people have become weak and sick and fallen asleep is they've forgotten that Jesus died for them. Now go back to chapter 15. Look what Paul says. He says in verse 9, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. I didn't even deserve to be called apostle. I used to persecute Christians. I used to kill Christians. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. You know, right here, Paul says, I can't believe it, but I've been forgiven of the worst of sins. I used to kill Christians. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. He totally accepted God's forgiveness. Is that awesome? But then he says, this was not a cheap grace. 
He says, his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Who's the them he's talking about? He's talking about the other apostles. Now, he's not boasting. He's just stating a fact. He says, man, I appreciated Jesus dying for me so much. I was in such appreciation. I, I even worked harder than all the rest of the apostles. Because his grace to me was not without effect. You know, today is April 8th, and Wednesday will be April 11th. You say, well, amen, that's great uh, calendar work right there, bro. April 11th is my spiritual birthday. And I was baptized April 11th, 1.30 in the morning, in 1972. And so this Wednesday is my 35th spiritual birthday. That's cranking out there, huh? That's older than a lot of you guys out in the crowd right there. And I'm usually asked two questions of, of people. It says, number one, how did you stay faithful so long? And then number two, is it worth it? I mean, here you are, 52. Is it worth it? You became a Christian at 17 years old as a freshman in college. How did you do it? And is it worth it? You know, I almost fell away after eight months of being a disciple. The guy that reached out to me, a guy named Jim Walker, loved him, appreciated him. He fell away with some really bad sins. And you know, when the person that led you to Christ falls away, oof, that's a hit. Are you with me? And then... My best friend, who I led to Christ just a couple months after I became a Christian, I baptized him, his name is Paul, he fell away in that same eight-month period. And I was, I was just, it was almost a knockout blow. And I really had to come to grips. What, what decision did I make? Did I make this to just to join a fired-up church? Did I do this for Jim? Did I, what I, what I was going to stay faithful only if Paul was faithful? And you know, some, all those events helped to purify my faith. I said, listen, no. Being a disciple is all about following Jesus Christ. Though none go with you, still, I will follow. That's the song, right? Well, many years passed, and there were many other challenges and temptations. But when I was about 30 years old in the Lord, and you can fall away any time. You know, people say, oh, no, I've been a Christian five years, 10 years, 20 years. I'm safe. No, no one's safe until they make it up there. You know what I'm talking about? As a matter of fact, there's a sin that attacks everybody that ages. Because, you see, we all carry along a little baggage. Now, I'm not talking about this, okay? I'm talking about bad experiences. And the older you get, the more you got of them. And if you don't forgive, as the Lord has forgiven you, you become bitter. I think it's the sin of choice of older people. Bitterness. Elena and I worked in the ministry here in L.A. for many years. The Lord had blessed us in many ways. And then a turn of events happened so that so many of the people that we had thought worked side by side was turned away from us. And it was a very hard experience. And once more, I had to really wrestle through what, what was I doing as, as a Christian? And I had to really separate out God from the movement. I mean... There were things that were happening in the church. There were things that were happening in the movement. I was going, wow, that can't be of God. And they weren't. But God was as awesome as when I was 17 years old and got baptized at 1.30 in the morning. And though it took me a year to really sort through my faith, I hung in there enough, weak as I was, sick as I was, I remembered Jesus died for me. And when you remember Jesus died for you, that he pushed you out of the way and took 
your place on the cross, it'll motivate you. Even in the toughest of times, you will stay faithful. You will not quit because Jesus didn't quit on you. Praise God, we don't have cheap grace. Amen, church? Let's go to Luke chapter 15. In Luke 15, we find a very familiar parable. And I have to, to share that when I when we read this parable, I thought about our new brother to be, Jared McGee, right here. Hey, Amen, bro? <laughs> Jared's going to get baptized today. And so we read in Luke 15, verse 11. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I mean, here's... This father's younger son, and he goes off to this distant country. He wants to get as far away from his dad as he can. And the Bible says he squandered his inheritance in wild living. And then a famine hits. He runs out of money. And here he is, a good Jewish boy, feeding the pigs. Even more than that, he's wanting the pig food. And then the Bible says... In verse 17, I love this line. When he came to his senses, you know, sometimes it takes us going through a real tough set of things in order to come to our senses. Are you with me right here, guys? When he came to his senses, says, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? Here I am starving to death. I'll set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him. And was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son. I love that right there. And he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and, and put on it. Bring a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill. Hey, we're going to have some steaks on the grill right here. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost as found. So they began to celebrate. Isn't that an awesome picture right there? You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6 that when we're baptized, because of our faith and because of our repentance, when we go down into the water, we die with Christ. We're buried with Christ. So that gets rid of sprinkling right there. Amen. And then we're raised to live a new life. That's what's going to happen to Jared today. And see, God has been standing there with Jared for 21 years. He says, Jared, I'm waiting for you. And a lot of us can relate because we were out there squandering our lives and wild living. Were we not? And then we finally came to our senses. And sometimes it took a rough set of circumstances. And then we came back to God. And God totally accepted us. God was fired up, and we were fired up. Amen? Amen? And so we've got to preach the resurrection of a new life. But you know, what's often gone unnoticed right here is there wasn't one prodigal son, but there were two prodigal sons. And you know, Jesus is the master teacher, is he not? Let's look at the audience that Jesus was addressing here. Go back to verse 1 in chapter 15. Now, the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So, his immediate audience were the tax collectors and the sinners. And that represents the, the one we call the prodigal son, the younger son. But Jesus always had a message for everybody that was listening, and that would include the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So, who do you think is going to be... The other son. Let's read about him. Verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, what's going on? 
Your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fatted calf because he has the bag safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young Go, so that I could celebrate my friends. He says, man, you got the steaks out when the younger brother came. You didn't even give me goat chops. Verse 30. But when this son of yours was squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatty calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Notice with both boys. With the younger son, the father is waiting. But when he sees his son on the horizon, the father runs after him and he greets him. And he just loves up on the son. Amen? Amen. Now the older son, who stayed at home, and yeah, the analogy is God being the father, the home being church. The older son that was in the church, well, he was outside in this particular occasion. And couldn't believe the celebration that was going on because of the younger brother. And because he saw all the fuss being made over the younger brother, he became angry and bitter. He says, things are not right in my father's house. Can you relate to that a little bit? And what, what, what does God do? Once more, God goes out to the older son. And he grabs him. You know, we, we look at those that come to be baptized. And we go, oh, praise God. Another sinner's come back to God. They need to be baptized. It's obvious they were away from God. But you know, there are a lot of people that are in the house of God that really don't have a relationship with the Father. See, this is what Dave Swan was talking about. Over time, a bad series of events had gotten him hurt. And when we don't forgive, hurt turns into anger and bitterness. And so what happened was, even though he was going to church, some, his life began to drift. And there's there so many people out there like this. They think, well, I'll just find a, a really fired up church and I'll go place membership. No, you don't need to place membership. You need to get restored to the Father. You may be going to church some, but you need to repent just as much as the younger son. And I know about you guys. I mean, I, I was really moved when Dave was up here just giving his heart, saying, hey, I messed up. And he told the Lord, I'm sorry. He told his family, he's sorry. He told his church family, he's sorry. I mean, now we know he's back with the Father. Amen? Amen. You know, I just got a challenge for you. Maybe Easter Sunday you go, well, it's my one time in the year. I'm coming to church. Maybe you're like the younger son. Maybe it's time for you to start studying the Bible and to see what it really means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and get baptized as an adult. Amen, guys? Or maybe you've been church hopping, you've been going to different spots, but you're not totally sold out. Maybe you need to study the Bible and see that you need to be restored to the Lord and become part of God's family that's sold out. Are you with me right here? Let's go to our last verse. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15. At the beginning of chapter 15, Paul, of course, is reminding us about the gospel. He's saying, hey, and this grace was not without effect. And then he concludes the chapter, beginning in verse 15. I love this. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we'll all be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of the eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that's written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? 
the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the church said, wow, what a powerful passage right here. Remember back in the Ezekiel passage, it says, our hope is gone. Well, see, as disciples, our hope is not in this world. Our ultimate hope is going to heaven. And right here it says, either one of two things is going to happen. When you die, you're going to be raised. Or if Jesus comes back again before you die, then you're going to go meet him in the air, and then you are going to be changed in a flash. In a twinkling of eye, the perishable, that, that's this stuff, is going to be clothed with the imperishable. Now, I was reminded about my perishable self just yesterday. You know, I've wanted to show my son a good time. So I invited over two of the brothers to play basketball with us. One that was Sean's age, DJ, and one that was sort of my age, Ron. Yeah, well, Ron's, what, 36, amen. I mean, 52, 36, about the same area as I see it. And I'm telling you, I mean, here's DJ and Sean running around doing these you know, layups. Ron and I, we're going for the long jumpers that we don't have to move on. You know what I'm talking about? My defense was just standing somewhere between Ron and the basket right there. And, you know, I mean, sometimes we had to call timeouts just to catch our breath. That was our strategy, not to die. And, and you know, I, I can't remember this ever happening, but, you know, we, we rotated teams and everything. It's Sean and me, and then uh, later on it was a DJ and me. But the in-between team was Ron and me. Yeah, they beat us 13 to nothing. I just don't know what's wrong with Ron. Lack of defense was pathetic. I'm telling you, you understand your mortality at the times like that. And, and you go, man, I used to be like Sean and DJ. And now, <sighs> you know, we often think, yeah, the old people, they're fragile. But you know something? Life is fragile. I remember way, 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 way back when Sean was a little boy and Sean had to get surgery for his back. He was born with a congenital birth defect and he had to get major surgery in his lower part of his back. He had to fuse five of his vertebrae. They'd take bone marrow out of his hip and then fuse his back and then they'd put him in a whole body brace. Now I remember just coming to see my first son there in the hospital, in his body brace, and just looking at him, man, his, his life is so fragile. Now, I snuck him some McDonald's french fries just to help him out. <laughs> I don't know if that was on the menu or not. I say, well, yeah, little kids, they're fragile. I remember when he was 18 years old. And everybody thought, including the doctor, that he had food poisoning. And I, I knew Sean was hurting. You know, for all the years Elena and I have been married, we've never had any of the children come into the bedroom and go, oh, I'm sick, I'm really hurting. Lo and behold, here's Sean, 18-year-old, comes into the bedroom, middle of the night, and goes, Dad, I'm really hurting. I said, what's wrong? He said, I think I got food poisoning. I go, okay, son, I'll get up. So I got up. I said, there's nothing much you can do. Either you wait it out, I've had it a couple times, or we go to the hospital and give you a shot, but you usually have to wait. He said, I'll just gut it out. Well, another day rolls by, we go to the doctor, another day. Well, lo and behold, we had some friends stay uh, with the boys, and we got a call from them. We were in New York, and it says, Sean has been rushed to the hospital. His appendix has busted probably a couple days ago. And one of our best friends lost their father to a busted appendix. All the garbage in your colon just goes out to your whole system. 
And I remember he got back from New York just in time to see Sean wheeled out of the, hospital, the uh, OR room. And here he, is all, here he is in the prime of life, 18 years old. And we're praying. He was having to take the morphine. In the next nine days, and Sean has always been thin, he lost 25 pounds. I mean, when he began walking after a few days, he looked like a miniature Gandhi walking around the hospital right there, you know. <laughs> but you know, you, you, you're 18 years old. I mean, aren't you supposed to be healthy? Aren't you supposed to live to 80? No. Life is fragile. And we need to appreciate what we've got. And the Bible says right here, that for the Christian, their hope is heaven. That we're going to come out of the grave, we're going to resurrect, and we're going to fly away to heaven. Does that fire you on up? Now look at the last part of this, this verse. In verse 58, it says this. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Hey, don't give up. Don't quit. It's worth it. Always. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So, wow, that's what this life's about, to always give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because that's the only thing that's not in vain because that which is unseen, the soul, is the only thing that will last into eternity. You know, I'll never forget earlier this year, Jack and Jeannie McGee coming to uh, Portland. And, uh, you know, it was awesome. They came and they go, wow, this is awesome. A church where everybody's fired up. I mean, the teens are fired up. The campus is fired up. And even the old folks like Nick are fired up. That's awesome. It's just, we want that. I said, well, I said, you got to come to us. He said, well, we're, bro, we're thinking about starting a new church there in Florida. I said, well, do you have someone to lead it? Well, not exactly. I said, well, then, bro, then you probably need to, to go someplace where the church is fired up. And I said, you know something? Yeah, you know, I'll let you in on something. Elaine and I have decided to go back to Los Angeles and start a new congregation of sold-out disciples. I said, Jack, I know you're 57. But you know something? What you need is one last adventure. <laughs> you should have seen the lights went on. One last adventure. They tried to check it out with Jeannie. You know, like, is it okay? One last adventure, you know? And, <laughs> and Jeannie speaks us. Well, you know, there are a couple concerns. And we do appreciate the sisters. Amen, bros. Yeah. Come on. I have my, my, my daughter who's married, and she's going to have a baby in July. I said, well, you... Go back and visit her when the baby's born. Well, that's an idea. Okay. And then we have our, our two sons living with us. I said, well, what, what do you think? Would they come? Oh, they're not about to come. I mean, Florida, go to California? And a lot of people, believe it or not, don't have a real good vision of L.A. I know that will shock you. <laughs> well, they went back, shared their plans, and a couple of days the boys goes, yeah, we're ready to go. Ready to go to California. Well, one of them, of course, was their son, Jared. Jared came to church, heard the word of God, hit his heart. He's been studying with the brothers, and today he's going to be baptized into Christ. Because his dad, his dad said, listen, I'm not going to quit. It's worth it, and it's time for a spiritual adventure. It's 57, it's still not too late. You know, it's kind of interesting. I appreciate it. just getting to know the McGee's a little bit. Last week, they were away from us. You say, why were they away? Well, they went to Syracuse, New York, because many years ago, Jack and Jeannie had met this young lady named Sarah. And Sarah, having a certain family situation, had called Jack up and said, listen, I thank you so much for meeting me and, and help me become a disciple and I would be very honored, since you're my dad in the faith, if you would walk me down the aisle. When I get me. Is that awesome or not? 
So they go on out to, you know, have Jack walk Sarah down the aisle. Well, in the meantime, when they got on out there, this is, this is, this is amazing. They start talking, and, and Sarah had one of her best friends come named Maria. Now, Maria was someone that Sarah had met that had become a disciple. So you see, one disciple makes another disciple makes another disciple. Well, they all got talking, and Jack and Jeannie were really excited about the Portland mission team going down to Los Angeles. They, they, they mentioned another couple that was going, Fred and Manu Batson. And Maria goes, is this like the big Fred? And Manu, that beautiful lady, says, yeah, that's, that's them. Says, I was the one that met them in the laundromat, and they became disciples there in Los Angeles. And get this. Unbeknownst to the McGee's and the Batsons, unplanned, they're both not only in the Ventura House Church, but they're both now living in the same apartment complex. So Jack is living with his spiritual great grandson. <laughs> See, sometimes we get questing our lives. We go, the Christian life is so hard, it's so difficult. My cross is so hard to bear. We're tempted to quit. We ask the question, is it worth it? Jesus didn't quit. The Bible says that he went to the cross for the joy set before him. Jack didn't quit. If you ask Jack, is it worth it? He will say, yeah. Amen. Jared's with me now. You ask Jack, is it worth it? I say, yeah. Fred and my news with me. You see, guys, we need to understand this, this life will pass. Yeah. Life is fragile. And so as disciples, if, if we are going to revive God's church, if we're going to resurrect it out of the desert, full of skeletons, then we've got to preach a resurrected Christ. We've got to live a resurrected life. And we've got to put our hope in the final resurrection. Thank you, and happy Easter.